Welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. I know that everybody's schedules are getting more and more packed now that we're adjusting to hybrid life versus, versus Zoom only life. Uh, but we have a really important topic and discussion that uh, we are hosting today with Dr. Adriana Westby-Trent from PCH, who is the clinical director over at PCH. And we're gonna be talking about the impact of a really systemically racist war on drugs and what we as mental health professionals uh, can and, and should and must be doing as part of social change. We will be talking for about 45, 50 minutes. We'll have a question answer, open discussion at the end. I do wanna let everybody know and remind everybody that this is being recorded and it will be loaded onto our YouTube channel. And with that, I am going to uh, let Adriana introduce herself. Usually when we do these um, presentations, we just kind of get into the grind and get into the topic and get into the content. But for this particular presentation, uh, I think both her and I really wanted to talk a little bit about why this is deeply important to us before we uh, get into the content. So I will let Adriana start with that. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um, as Amanda said, this is actually a really important and deeply personal uh, topic for both of um, us. Um, I had an uncle actually and a brother who embraced the stigma of criminality and have paid with their lives. Uh, my uncle was killed in 1993, my eldest brother in 1995. I remember just being so angry uh, with my brother for a very long time after he was murdered because one year before he was fatally stabbed, he was shot like not once, not twice, not three times, but eight times and survived. Uh, and so we thought about that as a miracle and a, a chance for him to make different choices. Uh, and his fiance and his unborn child did not survive that shooting incident. I understood his behavior only from the standpoint of personal responsibility which I now know is a characteristic of white supremacy. And, and also currently for me, I have a few nephews who are struggling with drugs, have been in and out of jail, and are just are facing so many challenges in terms of re-entry into society after having the label of a felon. And then most dearest to me, of course, is my 16-year-old son, Alex, who will be driving soon. I mean, it's unreal when I think of it, like 16, right? Um, but his chances of getting pulled over by the police for like a minor traffic violation and then getting his car searched for drugs is extremely high as a black, you know, male. And we live in the inner city of Los Angeles where police presence is very high. I really think that we're over police. My goals for preparing him for this encounter is twofold. I always talk about the fact that I want him to be able to get out of there alive. Secondly, I also want to ensure that he's not going to end up with a criminal record, which will then make his life even more challenging to navigate. The other influence in terms of just um, those young men in my life uh, and my interest for this topic comes from my aunt who used to be a defense attorney. She actually now works as a judge in the prison system and she helps to determine if and when inmates will get released. She was part of the task force actually during the time of COVID uh, who had to help determine which inmates, I believe they had like a, a set quota of over 45,000 or 4,500 people that they wanted to be released from prison in order to decrease some of the overcrowding during the COVID crisis. So she was a part of that task force. And her and I have been workout buddies for the past 10 years. So I essentially, I feel like I take a class in criminal justice four times a week while we work out. And I remember just having like feelings of disgust for the work that she was doing, at, especially when she was a defense attorney. And I would think to myself, like, why would you choose to represent these criminals? You know, who in my mind should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And that was certainly before I began doing my own research and reading the works of experts in the field, such as Ms. Michelle Alexander, Dr. Jody Armour, you know, and honestly, 
as I cannot unlearn what I've learned, there's a part of me that wish that I'd never read and learned these things because it's really just so overwhelming in terms of so many feelings, feelings of sadness, feelings of anger, and then just sometimes feelings of hopelessness about how far the law actually go to put people of color behind cages. I said all, uh, all that to say that I'm making the disclosure that it's from these experiences that you know I'll be speaking to you today about this topic and not as an expert in criminal justice. So, all right, Amanda. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that, Adriana. You know, eh, similarly, this is this is very personal for, for me as well. My my husband and my four, almost five-year-old son um, are both black. I am having another baby any minute, hopefully not during this presentation. <laughs> um, and uh you know, and I grew up as as a white person with a lot of, of privilege, and having uh, a black child and having my partner be black in this world has been a very um, scary. It, it's been scary. It's been overwhelming. It's been especially with my son. Um, you know, just last night we were looking at ultrasound pictures, and they have those really kind of creepy 3D ones now where you can kind of see the baby's face. Well, you can really see it, but they're still a little bit creepy. And I was telling my husband that I was convinced that this baby looks like him. Uh, and I am, like I, I think in this ultrasound picture that the baby looks like him. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Amanda, I, I really hope he looks like you because if he looks like you, he will have a much safer experience in in this world. And that's just, you know, it's heartbreaking. And knowing that my son right now is viewed as this cute little four-year-old, but in five, six, maybe even less years from now, the world is going to see him or some people in the world are going to see my precious baby as a threat is, um, it's, it's emotional. And working in the mental health field, uh, I'm very well aware of our of the roots of systemic racism in mental health treatment in, uh, in the war on drugs. So doing this presentation is important. I don't pretend to know everything, but I do um, seek to continue to, to learn and to grow. And I hope that we can all do that together today. So thank you all for joining this. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over. All right. Okay, we've prepared some slides uh, for you. And so our goal really is to get through these points in terms of the history of race, the you know, racist drug pro uh, prohibition laws and criminalization, um, the dangerous and traumatic impact this has had on mass incarceration and policing in the black community and just our role in social change, okay? Okay, so. I wanna uh, walk you through a very brief and incomplete history of the context of some of our drug policies in the US. So prohibition, as some of you may know, is relatively recent, probably only over the past 200 years compared to the length of time that mood altering substances have been around, which is about 6,000 to 8,000 years ago. And there are two reasons for prohibition, the protected, you know, to protect public health and I'm doing that in quotes because I really don't believe it. And I suppose if I put it in quotes, it'll make it not real. Um, and then the other one, which is the, you know, the reaction to fears of certain people, uh, groups of people. So let's start with, you know, opium. Okay. So you, you, you know, some of you might know in terms of opium on November 15th, of 1875, that was when the first anti-drug law was passed, right here actually in San Francisco, California. And it was aimed at Chinese immigrants. Some people argue that that was actually the first shot in the war against drugs, not when we come to the 70s, uh, what we know as the modern day drug war. 
the opium law specifically targeted the smoking of opium, which was the custom of the Chinese immigrants and not the myriad of the other forms of opium that were regularly consumed by whites. For example, like hero heroin, which you can see actually in the next slide, uh, was being marketed by Bayer's pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceuticals as the sedatives for cough, right? Now you have to understand the context of what was happening during this time. So in the mid 1870s, anti-Chinese sentiments as illustrated by the next slide, swept through the state of California, right? The economy was getting worse and Chinese immigrants were willing to work for low pay and many whites felt as if the low wages and the limited jobs were a result of too many Chinese workers. Therefore, the US uh, labor leaders actually supported drug prohibition as a way to uh, tarnish the reputation of the hardworking Chinese who worked in the mines and actually in building rail, rail word, railroads. This anti-Chinese sentiments eventually led to the Chinese Exclusion um, Act of 1882. So as you can see some of the, right? Hip, hip, hooray, Chinese excluded. Yes, that is a part of our history. Okay, all right, now moving on to cocaine. Now cocaine was given actually to blacks by plantation owners and other employers as a means of uh, improving productivity. In the late 1800s, poor black laborers in, in the South developed a habit of snorting cocaine to help them endure the strenuous conditions of their work. I mean, sniffing actually was the quickest and cheapest way to ingest cocaine and Cocaine sniff, uh, sniffing was actually more popular with whites and was especially associated with like criminal cultures of prostitution, pimping, gambling, things like that. And people from the upper and professional class actually did use cocaine, but they preferred to inject cocaine. When the racial tension in the South uh, became even more tense, that's when the, there was this transformation where black and cocaine became a source of white fear. There were medical publications supporting the myth that cocaine transforms law-abiding Negroes into predators and rapists, right? Like the coconized um, black. And news article like the one on the, um, you know, the next slide will show you some of the articles and publications that were written to solidify this association between blacks and cocaine. There was also the myth that cocaine gives black superhuman strength and makes them impervious to bullets. And I can't remember which state, but there actually was a state that actually changed the size of its bullet because it felt that the smaller size bullet would not um, be protective against blacks when they were coconized. All right, so let's move on to gan the ganja. Let's look to marijuana. So America had an influx of immigrants from Mexico in the early 1900s, just after the Mexican revolution. And they brought, you know, the Mexican people brought their customs with them and smoking marijuana was one of them, right? To unwind after a long day. Now I know that none of us on this, right? In this round table know anything about that. So we'll leave that at, at that. But that was part of their customs. And then what happened is that there were financial reasons actually to prohibit marijuana by big corporations and such as, um, what was it, Ford. Ford Motors discovered actually that they could extract ethanol from hemp. And so marijuana became the, um, the enemy. And then there was the strategic propaganda that connected, uh, started connecting terrible crimes with this drug uh, and Mexicans was the sure way to get the job done. Now, the next slide, what you'll see is an example of, news, of a news article in 1915, where the propaganda of coupling the uh, marijuana with Mexicans, okay? All right, let's move on to the Next slide, okay. So in 1930, this was the, I'll wait to get to the slide, one more. Let me review one other thing actually before I do the slide, yes, right here. Thank you. Um, in 1930, 
the first, our first, uh, our Federal Bureau of Narcotics was established and Henry uh, Enslinger was the first commissioner of that uh, bureau. And he actually believed that marijuana led to insanity, criminality, and death, which you can see this is part of that public service announcement flyer that was put out by, by that department. Now, he also believed that smoking marijuana made black people forget their place in society. And of course, the propaganda was very successful and eventually led to the Marijuana uh, Tax Act of 1937. Okay, now let's fast forward to 1971. And so what was happening in 1971, you ask? Well, I think some of us are old enough to know what was happening in 1971, right? Marijuana use was rampant, right? Hippies. And actually, um, it, the, and the hippies, and it was, it became associated with part of the countercultural identity that rejected the failing Vietnam War. And so President Nixon's uh, domestics policy advisor did an interview for Harper Magazine, as you can see in the next slide, in, um, in 1964, 1994, that provides some insight in terms of what the real target of this war and drug was. And so you can see from his recollection and his report to, in the interview, he, he said, you wanna know what this was really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt their, those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. All right, let's take a look at some stats. So as you can see in, from uh, 2001 to 2014, the reported use of marijuana between blacks and whites are pretty comparable, right? So you're seeing, there's no statistical difference when, if you're doing stats on these. And so you would expect, right, that the arrest rate would be the same if the execution of the war against drug is being waged equally, okay? However, when you take a look at this slide, you see that that's not, that is not the case. Blacks are, are arrested at a much higher rate than whites per 100,000 for marijuana uh, possession. And not only are they arrested at a much higher rate, they are more likely to be charged with a felon than whites for the same crime, okay? Now let's look at our nation's response to the opioid addiction crisis, right? Which was so profoundly different from its reaction to the crack cocaine um, crisis. But let's, thank you. Now, when, uh, when opiates became a huge problem and was seen mostly as impacting the white community, we had about three quarters of, what does it say here? I put my glasses on, sorry. So we had three quarters of $7.4 billion that was allotted in uh, 2018 by Congress to fight the opiate epidemic. Oh, sorry, yeah, let's, I, we can go back to the, um, yeah, that one first, and then I'll go back to cocaine. So, which was a much different uh, response, right? Where you have go to research, treatment, and prevention rather than police and prisons. And then when we compare that, let's go back to the, yes, to cocaine. When we look at cocaine, we had three quarters of $1.7 billion in federal funds that was allotted in 1988 to law enforcement and incarceration. Now there is this 100 to one weight 
racial disparity that was initially part of the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 that says for five grams of crack, that would trigger a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. Now, if you all know how much, uh, how much uh, five grams is, it's really like 0.17 of an ounce versus 500 grams of cocaine, powder cocaine, would trigger the same sentence. Now, crack was associated with Blacks, right? There was all the propaganda on the news about crack babies, right? We, we remember that in the 80s and the 90s. The crack babies, all of which presently have not been, that have not held up to science. Um, and then the 500 grams of cocaine, uh, powder cocaine was associated more expensive and associated more with uh, whites using powder cocaine. And there's really, there's no scientific basis for this. The only difference between crack cocaine and powder cocaine is baking soda, uh, baking soda and water, right? In terms of how it's made. Now, Obama actually tried to correct uh, I mean, Obama has his own issues in terms of how he's contributed to this, which goes way beyond um, this talk. But he did try to reduce the disparity, which really should be one-to-one -one ratio, right? But he did, uh, with the Fair Sentencing Act of 2020, this has been reduced from the 100 to one race ratio to 18 to one, meaning it now takes 28 grams versus 500, uh, 28 grams of uh, crack cocaine versus 500 grams of powder cocaine to trigger a minimum sentence of five years. Okay. Um, yes, now let's take a quick look at, for these individuals, um, including my nephews, the rights that are lost. And Amanda will get uh, more into um, this in a, in a moment. But the rights that are lost for these individuals when it comes to being labeled a felon. This slide really should have been labeled um, legal discrimination because these are the ways that you can actually dis discriminate against people that's totally legal if they have a felony charge on them. The one thing that I so appreciate about uh, PCH is that we, in terms of our application process, we don't ask someone for what we do background checks after the fact, but we won't ask someone on their application whether they have a felony or any kind of legal issues. And I so respect that because what has, if that was not the case, we have some very talented individuals at PCH that would not be at PCH had that been part of the criteria. So you meet someone and you interview them and you really like them as an individual and feel that they can contribute to this field. And then you check their records and then a felony comes up. And what we've done here at PCH is if that happens, we will call them back in and have a discussion with them in terms of talking and understanding what may have happened, what happened, help us understand why this is on your record and to see if that's something that we can um, work with. So that's one of the things that I really so appreciate about PCH. But again, your voting. So these are all the ways that getting your voting rights back in the states that you can is a huge hurdle. In terms of traveling, which is restricted while you may be able, you get your passport. Most places require for you, for you to have a visa. And if you can't get a visa, if you have a felony record, your rights to bear arms, is taken away, jury service. That's mind boggling to me because I'm thinking if I want to be judge, if I was to be in, uh, in front of a jury, I, I would think the people who have had experience in prison or in jail actually would want to have somebody on the jury that has that experience, that knows what that experience is like. Um, but no, you cannot serve on a jury. Again, employment in certain fields. And not only that, but then you are not, you can't get food stamps, you can't get subsidized housing. So if you can't get somebody to hire you and you can't get some place to live or you can't have food, where does that leave you, right? In terms of re-entry into this society. 
Now, Amanda is going to get into uh, a little bit more in terms of some of the um, some of these things that I mentioned uh, in a bit, but I want to just touch really quickly on although the written laws may appear race neutral in terms of the way that they're written, although we can debate that right in terms of the the min minimum mandatory sentencing law for crack cocaine right based on the, the number and having no scientific merit. But the, prob the big problem arises with how the laws are enforced, which is in a highly discrimin discriminatory manner. Police officers who control the point of entry into the criminal, criminal justice system have complete discretion of who to pull over. The courts have ruled that, uh, which is mind boggling when I found this out, the courts have ruled that minor traffic violations as totally reasonable it's you can can be used to stop a motorist and search for drugs and that that action is reasonable it does not violate the fourth amendment um, of unreasonable searches and seizures so who do you think gets pulled over more right why it, it's not the data shows it's not because blacks are using drugs more frequently than whites that's absolutely not the case. There's also no checks and balances with respect to prosecutors and who they, who they decide to prosecute. Who do you think gets harsher sentences by prosecutors for identical crimes? Why? Right? I would imagine that the majority of us, if not all of us in this round table, we would consciously denounce racism. We would verbalize explicit values related to equality, equity, inclusion. But what are our unconscious beliefs that guide your automatic behaviors? I imagine you don't exactly know if, or if not, it would not be unconscious, right? But we are all part of this system that has, as you can see, has has and continues to strategically dehumanize groups of people really for economic gains, right? It's this political machine and for uh, economic gains. And it's all around us, it's inescapable. And these messages and implicit coding is a big factor in the racial disparity in the war against drug and other social injustices in our country. And yet there is no room for arguing this point in our court of law at this time. You know, I know people are continuing to work towards trying to do so, but the Supreme Court has closed its door for these arguments over and over unless there's explicit evidence of racial slurs or things that are said, the doors are closed. Okay. So, Amanda. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I'm going to pick up a little bit uh, where where Adriana left off and then get into more of, you know, well, what's next? What Where do we go from here? But before I do that, I do think it's important as, you know, as difficult as it is to, to look at cold, hard facts, it's important because it's it's reality. And as hard as it is to look at it and to internalize it and digest it, imagine how difficult it is to be on the other end of it, experiencing the impact of, of these statistics. So nearly 80% of people in federal prison and almost 60% in state prison for drug offenses are black or Latino. Yet there are five times as many white people as black people in the United States. One in three black men between the ages of 20 and 29 are currently under the thumb of the criminal justice system. And then like Adriana said, you know, research shows that prosecutors are twice as likely to pursue a mandatory minimum sentence for black people as for white people charged with the same exact offense. So these are just some like standout statistics. And the impact is, it's very far reaching. Uh, I look at the impact on people who don't have citizenship in this country and um, even legal permanent residents. Any drug law violation can trigger an automatic detention and deportation without 
any chance of being able to come back. And these people might not have any access to or ties to community or family. They may lack basic survival needs like food or housing or health services and may be facing some th serious threats to their security. And what's interesting about this is that a simple marijuana possession, which now is legal in, in many states, uh, was the fourth most common cause of deportation uh, for any of, of any of the possible offenses. And when we look at what's going on in the trends, deportation for drug offenses are increasing between 2007 and 2012, they increased by 43%. Voting is another biggie to look at. And one in 13 black people of voting age are denied the right to vote because of laws that disenfranchise them uh, due to felony convictions. More than 10 states have disenfranchised over 20% of their male black citizens. And you know, the seduction of this drug war rhetoric has allowed for the erosion of a right that was fought so hard to to win and really we're talking about you know a modern day jim crow in the name of quote unquote drug policy the united states is the only democracy in the world to deprive its citizens of the right to vote after they have completed their sentences and you know we look at a state like like florida for example and the impact that this has and how this really um drives uh politics and you know outcomes in elections if we look at florida um we had a race a couple of years ago a bunch of years ago now actually where it was uh, a very close race and we had over two hundred thousand african-american men um who were not able to vote in an election and given the overwhelming support for then Vice President Gore among black voters, if these individuals had been allowed to vote, the outcome of the election actually would have been quite different. So what's happening is that black men, uh, black people, but black men in particular are being uh, deprived of the ability to have agency in who their elected leaders are. And politicians are, or certain politicians are um, very motivated to keep things this way because if they do, they maintain power, which is you know, ultimately the name of the game. If we look at employment and education, uh, the war on drugs has created bar barriers to employment, business loans, licensing, public housing, public assistance, uh, education and student aids. Uh, you know, people who were enslaved were purposefully kept illiterate and uneducated. And under the drug war, we are in the name of safety or in the name of a war on drugs, in essence, uh, doing the same thing. Because under higher education acts, any drug conviction blocks or delays all federal education assistance, including loans and even work study programs. And given that 55% of those convicted of drug offenses are black, um, you know, <laughs> this, this law doesn't impact white wealthy individuals who don't need financial aid. It targets the, the very people who, who do need it and prevents them from getting an education, which again, we know is a way to gain power um, in this society. And then lastly, parental, parental rights. Uh, you know, with child custody, a disproportionate number of black women have lost or stand to lose their children due to the war on drugs and black mothers regularly lose custody of their babies uh, when they are targeted for drug tests or show signs of past drug use in a way that, that white mothers are not targeted. So what do we do? How do we take action? And uh, Adriana actually shared this with me prior to the presentation, and I love it because I think it can feel kind of overwhelming. You know, where do we start? What what can I do as an individual to um, 
to help contribute to to change and to advocacy and to disrupt the status quo and to help dismantle this this system and there's lots of things that we can do um but not every form of advocacy feels congruent with an individual i i do think as mental health professionals we are in a, in a very unique position to play lots of different roles um, in pursuit of equity, in pursuit of liberation, inclusion, and justice. Some of us might be um, called to be these frontline responders who are uh, who organize resources and networks and and messages. Many of us, as mental health professionals, are naturally you know healers and. We really work um, more on the individual level or interge with intergenerational trauma and really fight, you know, white supremacy and racism and colonialism and capitalism and patriarchy and all these things in the work that we're doing individually with the clients and helping individuals to heal. Some of us are community storytellers or artists, others are bridge builders, some of us are, are disruptors. Um, who really um, speak up and take take action, especially when it is risky or uncomfortable. Some are caregivers, some are visionaries, and, and some are builders. At the end of the day, I I think that, you know, at different points in time, we might toggle between um, different roles. And we don't always have to play all these roles, but I think it is important to consider what role we can play at, at any given time. Prior to taking action, however, and this is something that Adriana also spoke about, it is imperative that we consider our own implicit biases. We have grown up and we are surrounded. We are in the middle of a society of a world that is built on, um, it's it's foundation it's founded in in white supremacy and systems are rooted in white supremacy. It is impossible to have not been impacted by that in some way. No matter who we are, what we've been through, what we look like, it is it is impossible. It becomes ingrained unconsciously in who we are. But it is our job to try to figure out how has it impacted us and what are our unconscious biases and to be honest, to be, you know, to be brave, to be courageous, um, and to look deep inside. Because if we don't know what our biases are, then the actions that we take, even with the best of intentions, might actually cause harm and do more harm than good. And you know, that's, that's certainly not what we want. And, and the work is hard. And, and I always recommend to people that, you know, I love doing it in trusted groups of people, uh, because sometimes we can see our biases reflected in other people. Sometimes other people can help us to understand and learn about our biases. Um, but, you know, I think most of us here as mental health practitioners are very bought into the idea that, sometimes doing the hard work, it's it's best done with somebody else or a group of people supporting us doing it. So I highly recommend, whether it's in your work communities or in your personal lives, that that this work is is done together um, and is done in, in groups. When I think about the war of drugs on drugs and, you know, different things that, um, that we can we can do when it comes to taking action. Um, I first like to ask myself a couple of questions and I, I challenge people to ask themselves these questions as well. Um, not only what roles do I feel comfortable with, but what roles make me come alive and, and give me passion and why? Uh, how can I stretch myself? How can I take or where can I take bolder risks? Because I think it is important to stretch ourselves. This work is not comfortable and advocacy is not always comfortable. In fact, sometimes it's very uncomfortable, but again, what a privilege it is to be able to take the action and not be on the other end of, um, of 
some of these racist policies and the impact of these racist policies. So how can I stretch myself? Uh, but what do I need to learn more about before I can stretch myself? When, not if, when I make mistakes, um, how am I gonna acknowledge them? And how can I correct them without feeling like I've, I've failed? And this is super important because um, mistakes will be made. That's part of the process. And how, how we acknowledge them and how we learn from them is what's most important in, in this process. And then who is my support system? Who are the people that can hold me accountable in a supportive and compassionate way as I seek to be a change agent in this? And that's where sort of, you know, the, the working as a group can be, can be super helpful. Just some concrete things. And I'm curious, I would love to, when we get into the next section of question answers discussions, but some things that I was brainstorming in terms of what can we as mental health professionals advocate for. And I think we can advocate for a lot because we are experts in the field of substance use, in the field of addiction. And we are in a very good position to, to advocate and to verbalize um, why these policies are incongruent with healing, with mental wellness, with recovery, which is why we get into the field. We want people to, to feel better. Um, and, you know, a couple of things that came to my mind were um, decriminalizing drug possession to remove a major cause of the disproportionate arrest and incar incarceration of people of color. We want people to receive treatment. And right now the largest treatment facilities are jails. And, and, and that's adding to trauma. That is, not, um, that is not healing. Eliminating policies that result in disproportionate arrest and incarceration rates. This includes changing police practices, rolling back harsh mandatory minimum sentences, eliminating sentencing disparities, we can advocate for a change in the way that police respond to mental health crises, um, to people who maybe, you know, are under the influence of substances and advocate rather for different ways to respond to these crises. We can advocate for expansions of um, mental health courts and drug courts, but that, that actually work, <laughs> that are diverting um, people into treatment rather than into prisons without two year wait periods that they have to wait, you know, at Rikers Island before they get into their treatment program. By ending policies that permanently exclude people with a drug arrest or conviction from key rights and opportunities. This includes barriers to voting, employment, loans, financial aid, child custody, public housing, and other public assistance programs. When I think about recovery, and I think about even like the 12 step models of recovery, you know, we, we make amends and we forgive ourselves first. The most important amend that we make is to ourselves. And to continue to punish people um, seems not only unjust, but it doesn't seem congruent with health and healing and with mental health and with mental wellness, which is um, you know, what we advocate for for our clients. There is no need to continue to punish somebody um, for A, an illness, uh, and B, something that they've gotten help and, and treatment for. Providing access to wraparound services um, outside the legal system and adopting pre-plea diversion programs that allow people with minor drug charges to successfully participate in treatment um, without having to enter a guilty plea. And that's, that's key, because right now, the way a lot of the diversion program works is that in order to gain access to a diversion program, you have to plead guilty. So it's a catch-22. To get the help that I need, I need to plead guilty. But if I plead, plead guilty, then I'm going to have this past that follows me for the rest of my life. So it seems like many people are just placed into a position where um, there's, no, there's no good choice. And that what we know is that um, generally speaking, people who have good choices to make, make good choices. So we wanna give them good choices. 
And with that, I am going to, um, to end things and turn this over to a q and A. I I do want to let people know that we will send out the slides for this. Um, and we do have a, a slide that is dedicated to different resources that people can read, listen to, watch, participate in. And I highly encourage people to, to take a look at these because they are um, wonderful resources and, and educating and, and reading and listening and learning as a way also to, to get at some of that implicit bias. Thank you all. Amanda, I wanted to add really quickly that you know, I, I think a big, all of the suggestions are great suggestions that need to um, happen in our community. I think the big one is something like this right here is just really having to reach people and change public opinions because the propaganda has really done damage to us as a country and how we, uh -huh. see, and how we see others. And so really changing and shifting collective consciousness so, so that people can care about each other and be able to see someone in front of them fully for who they are. Uh, not I, a big problem is where, where people say, well, I don't care about race. Well, that that's the problem. Mm -hmm. America is, is about race. And so um, it is a huge factor that has been used to manipulate um, us and to divide us. And so we really, as a country, if, if us, who are us, I think us is anyone who is not wealthy and typically a white male. So can you imagine the power that we would have as women, as immigrants, as Mexican American, and to be mobilized as a country, we could, we could tear the system and rebuild it. And then real quickly in terms of the issue, the, um, the slide about our role in social change, I wanted to thank Morgan. I, I see Morgan, Morgan. Morgan was actually the one who gave, um, introduced me to that slide. So yeah, very helpful. Thanks, Adriana. I appreciate that comment too, because the other thing also that, and this is something that I've been doing a lot of this year is um, talking a lot to directly impacted people um, rather than, I think, you know, reading and, and watching and listening and learning, all that stuff is, is, is wonderful. Um, but actually, you know, doing a lot more talking to people who have been directly impacted by the, the criminal justice system, people of color who have gone through the criminal justice system and saying, what do we need to do? Like, what, what are you, based on your experience, you tell me, what do, what do I need to advocate for, for you? Because they are the experts um, and, and they know, they know best. Any other questions, comments, experiences, personal, professional? David, is that a hand? Yes, am I unmuted? You sure are. Okay, I didn't know if we were supposed to speak up or just chat only, uh, but this is, this is fabulous and uh, <clears throat> You know, I was doing uh, workshops on discrimination and treatment in the 90s, and a lot of people didn't want to hear a lot of what I had to say back then, but you guys were spot on. And, and I've been doing advocacy for over 25 years uh, with NADAC and NATAP, and this really has never been a real part of the discussion. Uh, and so this is, this is great to hear. Thank you both. Thank you, David. David, I'm sorry, David, Amanda. I was just wondering, David, when when you were doing some of the work, what was some of the resistance that you that you came up against? Well, and the discrimination and treatment made me think of it when you said uh, white, middle, and upper class males, and and I mean that's what treatment was designed for originally, anyway. And so, 
you know, I remember early in my career uh, in 1990, looking at statistics on people entering treatment with um, people of color and Asian and, and different minorities that did not have the same access to treatment. Um, a lot of my discrimination treatment was around uh, uh, women uh, and, uh, and, and access to treatment and how they were, you know, if, if it was me going to treatment, people might surround my wife going, oh, well, he's a good man. He just needs to get help. But if it was a female, bad mom, bad wife, bad, 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 you know, all this stuff. And I think that's getting better. But what you guys are talking about is really not. And, and I have been hearing a lot of discussion about workforce. I was on a, a thing this morning with a board and they were talking about workforce development for people of color because it, it, it's high in demand. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were talking about a lot, but that's, that was kind of in a nutshell. The, the resistance was uh, a, a lot of the men uh, when I was doing this workshop once upon a time, did not want me to hear, I uh, did not want to hear how, uh, you know, women really didn't have a voice uh, when it came to this and how they were uh, looked poorly upon, uh, you know, uh, when, when seeking treatment uh, and how, how treatment and therapy uh, was, was designed for white, middle and upper class males. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we, I, you know, step one is, is ensuring that, you know, we address um, basically the criminal justice system is serving as the modern day Jim Crow. Um, but we also need to look at mental health treatment because mental health treatment is also rooted in white supremacist and, and systemically racist um, uh, systems and policies. So yes, we want to have people in treatment and not in, in jails and prisons, but we need to make sure that treatment is safe for people of color too. And, and I think we have a lot of work to do there as well as you're, as you're noting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah this is point. great. Thank you guys both. Adriana, good to see you. You too, David. Good to see you. Yeah, no, in terms of just treatment, treatment has traditionally been associated, right, with uh, whites and punishment with black. I was just, it, it reminded me of even um, just the stereotype and the propaganda around black uh, people and how much pain uh, blacks can actually take compared to whites, which actually has worked to the disadvantage of white. And this is how we are all impacted by the system because I believe that that had something to do with the crisis in the white community with regards to painkillers and, and opiates. Because blacks, actually there are studies that show that when blacks go and they report their pain level, it's the same pain level that they may report to their physician, they're less likely to get uh, pain medication versus whites that report the same level of pain. Hence, more pain medication was dispensed to white people. And in the long term, certainly, I believe led to, you know, contributed to that, the, that crisis. But that again, you can see how within the system, how this propaganda um, that doesn't serve any of us. And so I really getting people to see how this impacts us all. And if we can just see that this is a machine, a political machine that is really for economic gain and that we're all pawns, we are being used as pawns in the system. And if we can mobilize, we really can get some good work done. It's going to be hard because if that was to happen, the prison industrial system that is a huge money making machine would absolutely fight back. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I see a hand. Is it? Okay. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, yeah. just a quick, quick, two, two quick comments. Um, you know, and, and I'll say this just in, in, in honesty and transparency. I've been involved in a lot of conversations like this for many years and not much has happened. Um, and obviously I'm a, I'm a man of color. So I have two questions. One of the things that I always find interesting about these conversations, you have two lacking cohorts that seem to never be at the table. One, it's men of color and law enforcement. 
so we can we can all do whatever we want. We can talk about whatever we want, but without getting those those two cohorts to the table, you're going to be at square one all the time. So we're going to be just kind of on the hamster wheel. So my question is always, how do we do that, right? How do we get those people to the table and have a really truly holistic conversation? That is a great question. Um, is it you say? How do you say your name? My first name is Juan, but everyone calls me Jay. Jay. Okay. Hi, Jay. That is I a know. good question. Um, you know, in I don't know what's going on in New York, but in LA, um, I had I did a roundtable or a conversation between LAPD when we had the um, the protest, and a lot of the protesters were being arrested here in um, LA, and the police department came together and wanted to have a conversation and elicited volunteers from therapists to come in and have conversations between protesters and the police department so that they can begin to try and understand each other and um, bridge some gap. So I know those things have been looked at in LA. Um, there were three of those conversations that happened in Los Angeles County. Absolutely, it's, it's the start of, it's just a drop in a huge, large bucket. You're absolutely right. Um, but I do know that LA has been looking into some of those things and having those conversations between law enforcement and um, people who are impacted by these discriminatory execution of the law. I, I, don't, I don't know about um, New York. Amanda, do you know anything about what's going on with New, in New York? Yeah, well, New York is starting to pilot um, a program actually in certain areas of the city. Well, they're going to be starting in a couple of months to pilot a new program. Um, which is addressing just this um, sort of police, uh, removing police and having uh, mental health workers to respond to mental health emergencies. And I believe that when those uh, programs were put into place that a lot of different people, they actually created a new position with the, within the NYPD um, to help to facilitate the creation of these new programs. So I'm, I'm they haven't started yet. I'm curious to see how they work. But Jay, to your point, you know, I agree. Like, you know, we need to have directly impacted people having a seat at the table in order to really address these issues. Um, it, it doesn't work if you don't. Yeah, I live. I live in Massachusetts, and we have, which we were just talking about in New York. We actually have a pretty well established program in parts of the state that do bring mental health. But you know, when I ask those questions, one of my thoughts is always, how do we step back a few years before folks are at the place where they're kind of at the precipice of being involved with the legal system mm -hmm. and some education way before that. So it doesn't even get to that point. Um, I think police, you know, for instance, my little, my younger brother just became a cop in Connecticut. And it disturbs me to know that police get six months of training. This is not included in the training whatsoever. So that's a place that I think when I talk about law enforcement and how do you get them involved is how do you get them trained way ahead before they even get out in a car, before it even they talk you know, talk to, to somebody so you get some of those stereotypes out of their heads, some of those negative thinking things out of their heads beforehand and really educate them. So, you know, because I think police have a lot put on their head. And, I, you know, I don't know if folks are familiar with the former commissioner of Boston. He said it one time, he said, look, you know, we have hot cops showing up to places and we have, we're wearing like 99 hats, yeah. you know, yeah. but then they're not armed with the proper knowledge to even address half of those hats. You know what I'm saying? So there's a yeah. lot more to be done. So when I say what I say, it's really just trying to understand kind of how we can all work together to, to do things prior to or it's kind of right at the right at the edge of things yeah no, i appreciate that yeah so appreciate that jay because yeah, yeah absolutely right and especially police are in a situation and they're more likely to come into situations where their nervous system are being triggered in terms of um, feeling unsafe and we respond from that place on a very implicit way and so really learning and understand implicit bias i think would be the first thing at, PCH, we, in our social justice meeting, we talked about how do we, we're trying to figure out how do we get into the police department or have them have to take this implicit bias test or trying to figure out something that people, they can know themselves and know what's going on with them uh, before stepping out with a gun, right? And feeling unsafe and then responding based on those encoded messages that have been, that we've all been, um, yeah, that have all been encoded in us. So I hate to uh, I hate to cut us off now because I feel like the conversation is getting started, but it is after the hour and I know that we were scheduled for an hour and people have other things to go to, but I, I will we'll follow up. We'll have another um, roundtable to continue on with these discussions because 
they're important. And, you know, I think it's great that everybody is engaging and coming to the table and having these conversations. So thank you guys for coming. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next round table, which will be July 8th about attachment theory. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you.